Let me just do a real quick uh, recap of the, the, the first couple of talks, and it's going to be very, very quick. Uh, we started out basically just introducing the Arctic and talking a little bit about what it was and how it's defined and all that. And I'm going to sum that up in one sentence. For today, the Arctic is all that part of the world above 66 and, and, uh, and, two thir and a third degrees north latitude, which is known as the Arctic Circle. Uh, and then in the, in, the, in the rest of that first talk, uh, we, we spent some time uh, in, in the Canadian Arctic, in particular here on an expedition in uh, El northern El Ellesmere Island. And then we hopped across the ocean and did another expedition in, on Wrangell Island as part of the, of the Russian Arctic. And then in the second talk, we spent our time exclusively in northwest Greenland with the uh, polar Inuit, their polar Eskimo, depending on uh, your point of view. And uh, we also spent some time traveling with them, as well as the descendants who still live up there of the American explorers, Robert Peary and, and Matthew Henson. Today, we're going to spend our time in Scandinavia and the good old United States of America. So, and, and today we're going to show, we're going to see the tremendous variety uh, in the Arctic. You know, many people, myself included, before I went there, uh, think of the Arctic as ice and snow and nothing but. Uh, and that is true in some parts of the Arctic. Some parts of the Arctic, especially up toward the North Pole, are ice and snow all the time. But there are other parts that are not. And we're going to start out in, in Svalbard, which is, uh, and, and there we will be doing a, even though it'll be springtime or heading towards springtime, it's going to be a winter trip, ice and snow there. Then we're going to go to Sweden and Finland, and that'll also be a winter trip, but that's going to be a winter trip that's like, you, you may, if you didn't, I didn't tell you, you might say, well, isn't that Vermont you're showing there? Because it looks very much the same. The climate is very similar and, and uh, there are people around in hotels and everything. And then finally, we're going to go up to, in a summer trip to the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is one of the last remaining true wildernesses in, in the world, not just in the United States. So let's begin with, uh, with, with Svalbard, which is an expedition I did in 2006. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Whoops, what's going on? Sorry. Oh, I was going the right way. Okay, so we're back to the first slide. And, and there's Svalbard right there. It's this archipelago that is located halfway between the top of continental Europe and the North Pole. And uh, it is sovereign territory of Norway, uh, but as we're going to see, there are there are some major caveats to that statement. Uh, here's another way to to look at. Um, you know, is it possible to get the lights down a little bit more? Uh, this is a map. Uh, most of what you see here is 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 Russia, which is outlined. Like there we go. That's better. Okay, now now we're. Set. Uh, and what you see are these islands. Uh, Greenland is here. This is Iceland. This is Svalbard. That's what we're going to be talking about. And then these are all uh, islands uh, in the Russian Arctic. Uh, this one is an island called Novia Zemla, which means New Island. Uh, you may have some of you may have read about that. It's been in the news a little bit recently because. Uh, the polar bears have been have been chasing the children up there. there there's actually a small town up there, and because of the uh, lack of ice, the bears have been invading uh, human territory up here and 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 causing a, a bit of a problem for them. I don't know why anybody in the world wants to live there. I don't think there are many because that's actually the other the thing that this island is really. I won't say famous, infamous for is that was the site of uh, 
much of the uh, Russian uh, nuclear testing, uh, both underground and above ground, uh, what they didn't do in Kazakhstan, they did here. Uh, and then these are a couple of other Franz Josef land, and this is called Severina Zemla and the New Siberian Islands. And then Wrangel, which we visited a few months ago, is over there. But Svalbard is up here. Here's a, uh, a blown up map of Svalbard. Uh, I don't know, there's something like 100 islands if you call, call in all the small ones. But we're going to spend our time on the largest island, which is called uh, uh, Spitsbergen. This is what I saw when flying into, uh, into uh, a small bar. As you can see, a lot of ice and snow. Uh, it's beautiful sights, and the, the glaciers uh, are flowing. It almost it looks like whipped cream that it's, that's flowing down through the valleys there. Uh, very beautiful uh, scenery. Let me talk a little bit about the history uh, of, of Svalbard. As far as we know, there was no indigenous population. And uh, the first visits may have been by the Vikings in the 12th century. There's no real solid evidence for that, but there's some incidental evidence. The first real documented uh, discovery and, and, and knowledge of, of Svalbard comes from a Dutchman by the name of William, Willem Behrens. Uh, who was the first to get there and documented and he actually explored quite a bit of the Soviet Arctic. He's very well known in Russia uh, as a result of that. In fact, you'll see there are some towns and, and places named after him. Uh, from 1600 after Behrens was there up until um, 1920, Svalbard was basically a, a, a no man's land. No country claimed ownership and it was a free for all with uh, countries including England, Netherlands, France, you can see the list here, um, all going there and, and basically doing uh, whaling, hunting, trapping, uh, tapping natural resources. Uh, during the 1890s, there was uh, some exploration of the interior. Up to that point, the, these, the, the uh, earlier had all been hunting and so on, had mostly been out on the ocean surrounding Svalbard. But in 1890s, the uh, interior was explored. We're gonna, and this is a, uh, a page from the uh, Geographical Journal, which doc documents the first crossing of Spitsbergen by a man by the name of Martin Conway. Here is another map of mostly Spitsbergen. As you can see, it's very mountainous. Well, as you saw from that picture as we were flying in, it's extremely mountainous. And uh, this, is the, this is the route. I'm going to blow this up in a second, but that's this, the route that we took on our uh, trick, uh, travels across Spitsbergen. And here's the blow up. And that's our route, which we did in 2006. And here's the route that uh, Sir Conway did uh, back in 1896, and his route and ours were, for the most part, uh, identical. The only real significant difference, he didn't get out onto the, onto the sea, whereas we spent a couple days uh, on the ocean, on the ice. And uh, he went around clockwise, and we went around counterclockwise. <laughs> Other than that, it was pretty much the same, same route. This is a, um, a picture of the kennel that we were, uh, that we got our dogs uh, from. And it was just fortuitous that uh, accidentally, I didn't realize it when I took this picture, but there's some very interesting structures up on the top of this mountain over here. And I blew that up, and what it is, is it's actually a couple of, of steerable radio telescopes. It's part of a European uh, uh, establishment where they are studying the interaction between our ionosphere and magnetosphere and the solar wind and so on, uh, which are very much involved in the Northern Lights, which we're going to come back a little bit and talk about when we get to Finland. But this uh, is, is a, also is significant in that scientific and educational activities, actually the 
the number three industry in, in, on, in Svalbard. Okay, well, now we've left the city, we're on the trail, and we're walking up, heading up toward, uh, toward one of the glaciers. And you can see the, the scenery is just absolutely spectacular, uh, every place you look. Here we have gotten up onto one of the glaciers. And again, just gorgeous scenery. Let's go into a little bit more modern history. Uh, in 1906, coal mining got started in, on Svalbard. And that was done by actually an American by the name of uh, uh, Longyear. Uh, then in 1920, as part of the Versailles Conference, uh, Norway was granted sovereignty over Svalbard. Like I said, up to that point in time, it was a no man's land. No country had, had true uh, ownership. So they gave it to Norway, but there were a, lot, there were a number of caveats. Uh, one of the caveats was they can, Norway can tax people on, on Svalbard, but they can only use the money on Svalbard. They can't take it back to continental Norway. Another one is that the citizens of the signatory countries, of which we are one, and, and there are probably 30 countries that are, uh, can go there and engage in and commercial activities and you don't need a visa. It's, it, it, so you can go to Svalbard anytime and, and start a, a new business or, or do whatever you want there uh, without any special permission. Uh, they're supposed to protect the environment. It's supposed to be a demilitarized zone. And that lasted until World War II, uh, when uh, the UK, Canada, Norway, Ger and Germany all had various operations up there, and there were actually some battles on Svalbard. Uh, the, the Germans were trying to establish some weather installations there to help uh, protect the, the area of the, of the North Atlantic there, which was where the uh, uh, which was a vital thing for, for, for them in, in the war. So there were actually some military action there. Uh, and then uh, during the Cold War, why the Soviets uh, had various strategic uh, outposts there. And in their case, they were concerned about their uh, only access to the only seaports they have to the open ocean are in Murmansk and um, I forget the other city, but the, the northern cities there, and so that's a, a vital interest to them from a from a military strategic point of view. Now, talk a little bit about the economy. The number one uh, industry on Svalbard to this day is mining. Uh, like I said it was started by an American. Uh, as far as I know, there are no Americans doing coal mining anymore, but the Russians are very active with coal mining, and in particular. They have a lot of people they've imported from Ukraine to, to actually go into mines and, and get the coal out. Uh, the second largest industry is tourism. So that's, uh, I was contributing to, to the growth of that industry. And then, like I said, science and, and education in general is the third uh, source of economic activity on the island. OK, back on the trail here. Uh, we're. Uh, just to give you a few more pictures of the gorgeous scenery that we had. Uh, this picture, you'll notice that uh, this is Peter, uh, one of our guys, is, is very lightly dressed. Well, that was because we got there uh, for a heat wave. It was un unusually warm, and actually that caused us a problem because the snow was very soft. It was very difficult uh, for the dogs to pull the sleds, and it was hot, okay, if you're doing a lot of activity like we were. Uh, it, it got worse, as you'll see in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is one of our camps. Uh, we're actually camped in the middle of a frozen lake. Uh, and uh, this is actually an iceberg that was trapped in that lake uh, by the ice. And you can see some of our tents here and the dogs scattered out here and here. And uh, this is, I think, where the kitchen was that day. And, and, uh, and not only did we have nourishment to stay alive, but to have some fun uh, 
alcohol was, uh, was, is not something we're, we use on these trips, but hot tang is a big, uh, is a very popular, <laughs> popular tra uh, treat in, in the, uh, and here's some more happy people drinking some more tang and even more drinking some more tang, having built a nice little auditorium style uh, place where we could all sit and, and chat. Uh, another scene of the, uh, and we were up there in the, in the spring, but it was 24 hour daylight when they were there. There was no, and this is, this is really as close as it got to the sun setting. It was, got down fairly close to the horizon, but it never went below it. Uh, here's yours truly here, and you can see I've just got a light, a very light wind shirt on, as does my uh, partner on the sled there. It was, it was very, it was very warm. Uh, one of our guides, you can see she's just got a light shirt on. Here we are up on one of the glaciers. One of my favorite pictures of it's, it's just how, uh, and another favorite picture. Here we are with the sun again setting and uh, one of our party, instead of sleeping in a tent, decided to sleep outside and, and, and uh, keep the dogs company. Here we are out on the uh, out on the sea, and it was as extremely foggy. And uh, I, I love that picture, and I love thinking about that. And that night, uh, I wrote in my diary. I said, at, at times like this, the Arctic presents your mind with a blank canvas on which to paint your dreams. Uh, so I have wonderful memories of that. Now, people always say, well, did you see any polar bears? And the white bear is present throughout Svalbard. Uh, there are many that live there. Uh, one must be vigilant at all times. In fact, it's, it's the law that outside the city limits of Longyearbyen, the main city, you must have a weapon with you. And uh, so we had... Uh, a fairly powerful rifle, a shotgun, a bunch of beer ba uh, bear bangers, uh, big ones and small ones, and so we were pretty well set. Uh, we, we saw many seals on the ice, which is the favorite food of the bears, uh, but, and we saw a lot of bear tracks, uh, and, but we had a lot of smelly people and dogs. And a dog and the bears can smell that many miles away, and, and they don't want anything to do with people, and even less to do with dogs. Uh, in addition to which, we had this young lady who was our Swedish guide, and she had her uh, rather powerful uh, rifle with her wherever she went, along with the map. Uh, and you can see the map and the, and the rifle. So she was with us. So any bear came along while she was going to take care of them. Uh, I'll, I'll give you another example of taking care of a bear. And just, well, right now. So at one point, you can see here we are back out that scene where we're out in the ocean. And you can see these big pie plate sized tracks there of a bear that had been through there fairly recently. And uh, we saw that bear and he approached our group looking fierce. Uh, despite what I just said about they won't come up. This is this is this is a joke. So we sent the strongest member of our team to take care of him, and she did. You can see <laughs> where he ended up. <laughs> this is Beth. She was a lifelong uh, naval wife, and, and her husband passed away, and she decided, hey, it's my turn to go explore the world. She, she was somewhere in her 80s. She said, I, I want to see the Arctic, and so she was, she was with us on that trip. Of course, I'm joking about, the, about her taking care of the bear. The, in fact, in all of my travels in the Arctic, I have never seen a polar bear except in a museum or hotel lobby stuffed. I've seen plenty of tracks, plenty of seal kills, plenty of evidence that bears are around. But, but like I say, they, they tend to avoid us. Another shot up on the glacier. Here you see some of the uh, so-called Svalbard reindeer. And it's a close-up of one of them, and it's actually a distinct uh, species of reindeer that uh, DNA evidence indicates that evolved about 4,000 years ago, or over the past 4,000 years. 
Okay, now I said it got worse as far as it being warm. In the final couple of days, we were supposed to have an easy cruise down a river. And when we got there, we were dismayed to see that the river was no longer frozen. And so if you can see, uh, this is our leader, Paul, one of our leader, Paul Shirky. He's actually pulling the dogs, and that's because the dogs will go any place you want them to, except they don't like to get wet. And so if, if it comes to water, you've got to pull them across and, and give them some major encouragement. And if you think this looks bad, I mean, you can see it's pretty wet and soggy and people are sinking in. Well, this is what it looked like a little bit later. And as I said to uh, our guys, why didn't we bring Zodiacs instead of dog sleds? <laughs> that would have been a lot easier. But we did manage to get through, and uh, it may have been a little worse for wear, the sleds, as a result. But anyway, they, they survived. OK, here we are outside of um, back in heading into Longyearbyen. This is the town of, of Longyearbyen, which is the capital of Svalbard. And it is, I think, the northernmost occupied uh, city in the world. Uh, it has a population of about 2,000 during the summer and maybe down to about 1,000 during the winter time. And another interesting feature here is you notice the pipes are all, these are, these are water and sewage pipes, they're all up in the air and above ground. That's because the permafrost makes it impossible to go underground to, to put, the, put the plumbing in. And the houses all have very steep roofs for uh, all the snow to fall off. Okay, that's, that's Svalbard, that's Norway. Let's go across the border uh, or go down to continental Europe now and talk about Sweden and Finland. And uh, here we are, that's right there. Uh, another shot of Sweden and Finland. And this trip, uh, the other trips I've done with the Arctic have been, for me at least, true adventures. These, this trip was, I have to say, a tourist trip. Uh, and, and we had a real smorgasbord of whatever, however you can get around uh, in the wintertime on icebreakers or, or snowshoeing or Nordic skiing or in a sleigh with a reindeer, or hiking, whatever, dog sledding. Uh, some of the highlights, as we'll get to in a minute, were a visit with some of the indigenous Sami. And we did get to see the uh, aurora on, on five occasions, which was, which was really uh, wonderful. But this was a, a, little, bit of, a little bit of everything. Uh, now, the, the first part we did, and this was, was just my friend and, and I, we, we came into Rovanami, which is a, a, a town in Finland. We rented a car and we drove over to two towns called Galavari and Jokmak. And here we are on the road, and that doesn't look like the Arctic, at least as I used to imagine the Arctic. That looks like I'm up in the Adirondacks or, or someplace here in Vermont. And this is just one of, and there are hotels and, and all kinds of things for tourists to do and stores and churches. And I mean, it's like, it's like being here, okay. Uh, the one thing they have that, that I, is, is really cute is they have these, these neat little sleds for taking things around for, for shopping. And, and outside of all the shops, these sleds are there that you can, that you can borrow and take your groceries home and, 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 and presumably bring it back. Uh, another little interesting town that we, we were in was uh, uh, Kirkstock, and this is uh, a town where uh, they were trying to accommodate the obligation that uh, religious people had to uh, go to, to church every Sunday, except that many of them lived a long distance and it was not possible for them to get to church on Sunday. And so they made an arrangement where they basically built a small village. And then I think it was once every three months, they would come and actually spend the weekend uh, so, they could, so they could fulfill their, their church going obligations without uh, undue uh, stress in, in a long journey trying to do it all in one day. OK, uh, now we're going to go back and we're going to cross over and go over to Finland. Oh, sorry, let me back up one second. Uh, 
we went back to Rovaniemi and then we, we joined up with a group, a tour group actually. And first we went down to the uh, Bay of Booth Bay here and there was an ice castle there and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, an icebreaker. And then we went further up into, into Finland, northern Finland, some of the national parks up there. I'll give you a little. Now this one is this ice castle that was down in the south. And I didn't realize it at the time. It was only when I got home. I actually bought this hat uh, when I was over there. And it's very appropriate that the thing basically lit up. And I feel I was, must have been in a very holy mood there looking at that particular. <laughs> Got the halo around my head. Uh, here's the icebreaker that we went on. And uh, another view. And as you can see, uh, the ice wasn't very terribly thick there. It was maybe a, a foot or so. And, and this particular ship had, had no problem at all uh, slicing through that kind of ice. This, they, a lot of international travelers on this trip, on this ship, and they had to accommodate them all. And some of them were not familiar with our Western ways. And so we had to show them you know, how to use the facility. Uh, when I'm in Asia, I have to, get, I have to turn the sign around. So I'm <laughs> uh, and another one interesting with respect to the facilities is I, I never did figure out what, what, where you were supposed to go with this one. <laughs> Okay, stop me. That is actually the name of uh, not, a, not a country, but an area that the indigenous Sami regard as sort of their, their country with, uh, uh, of theirs. And it actually spans three countries, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and, and Russia. Uh, and, but of that territory these days, only about 5% of the population is actually uh, the Sam, indigenous Sami people. The rest are all Norwegians and Russians and everybody else. Um, they uh, the, live about 5,000 of them in, in Finland, uh, a couple thousand in Russia, 17,000 in Sweden, and the largest population uh, 35,000 is in Norway. And uh, this is their very colorful flag, uh, which is sort of an amalgam of the flags of the four countries uh, in, which they, uh, in which their land is, is located. And I think it is in Norway where one day a year, uh, instead of the Norwegian flag, uh, it's, it's, uh, they fly this uh, Sami flag. And speaking of Samis, this lady is one of them. And we're at her home, and uh, she's got a, a, a reindeer farm there, and she makes a, does a lot of handicraft work. And in fact, I, I brought along a pair of her, the boots, beautiful boots that she had made, which if they, I wish they were my size, because they'd be great for walking in winter, because the reindeer skin on the bottom is sort of like the, um, the, uh, what you put on the bottom of cross-country skis to get up so you, you can avoid slipping. It's, it's uh, a really a, a beautiful piece of work. Uh, okay, well, here's somebody wearing one. And here's, this is not in her home. This is actually in a, a museum where we stopped in a, a little gift shop, and that's the lady who actually sold me that particular pair of, of boots. Uh, Another thing, I'm a big fan of a board game called Catan. And while we were in the Sammy house, I noticed there it is. And I said, whoa, what's that doing there? She said, oh, this is one of our favorite games. We play this all the time. So uh, I know if I go back over there, I, I've got at least a couple of people that I can play Catan with. Uh, they are uh, a, a reindeer herding culture of which there are something like a little over 20 uh, spread all over the, uh, basic, mostly the Russian side and, and the Northern Europe. There is actually one uh, reindeer herding uh, culture in uh, Alaska, but most of them are over on the other side. Uh, and I've actually had the privilege of 
traveling with, this is Kamchatka, which is part of Russia, and I was traveling with a, uh, a reindeer uh, herd, uh, uh, a family who is, uh, uh, I guess, nomads, I guess is what I'm, word I'm looking for. Uh, but right now we're over here on this side, and we're in, in uh, up here in, in, in Finland. Okay, the Northern Lights. Uh, now, I can't claim credit for this picture other than the fact that I took it from a picture that was hanging in a wall at one of the hotels we were in. <laughs> uh, but, and I can't claim p credit for this either. I took this off the internet someplace. But this is actually fairly typical of the displays that we actually saw. That first one was a spectacular one that is very rare. But this is, this we did see displays uh, somewhat like this on, on as I said, five uh, occasions. And as a physicist, I'm always, I was I'm all very intrigued of what, what causes the northern lights. Whoops, I'm sorry, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, this was one of the places we stayed where they actually had glass igloos where you could go in and you're nice and comfortable and you got your bedding and all this stuff here and it's completely open so when, the, uh, when it gets dark, you can watch the northern lights from your, from your bed. Which was, and, and we did see some that night. Oh yeah, now let's, let's, let's get to do some physics here. Uh, a very out of scale uh, diagram of our sun and our earth. And uh, the, the magnetic field of the earth is very highly distorted. Normally it would be, it would be symmetrical, but the solar wind, which is, basically mostly electrons, some, pos some protons, some helium nuclei, uh, basically pushes, most squishes, it pushes the, um, the, the, the uh, magnetic field of the Earth out. And that's, a, that's mostly a good thing because that means that all of those high energy particles that are streaming out from the sun don't get to you and me where they would, 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 would do some damage. Most of them are swept away by our Earth's magnetic field. However, some of them do manage to sneak in and come down uh, uh, from the north and from the south, and they end up mostly interacting with the ionosphere in, in two rings uh, located, as you can see here. Uh, let's see, I just said that, electrons, right? And yeah, that ring, uh, I think I got a better, yeah. The ring is actually centered at the geomagnetic North Pole. Uh, here's a, a, a forecast, but it gives you a feeling for where the, where the ring was. The North Pole is here, and as you can see, it's not centered around the North Pole. The North Geomagnetic Pole is actually located uh, right about here in, on Ellesmere Island. And that, what do I mean by the geomagnetic? We all know the, the magnetic pole that we point our compass at, which is the, uh, the magnetic lines of force on the ground that can help us go north if, until we get that. The, the geomagnetic pole, though, is, is basically, it's, it's concerned with the, the, the far space uh, magnetic field and where is that centered. And that is centered at um, uh, around the uh, geomagnetic pole. In fact, it's at 66 degrees. So it's sort of like the, the geomagnetic Arctic circle where the northern lights occur. Uh, the North Pole has been in a, a bit in the news in recent months because it's moving faster than it has been in, in past decades. Uh, it's always been moving ever since it's been around, ever since Earth's been around, but it's, it's, it has accelerated here in recent years and, and is now uh, has, has moved pretty close uh, to, to the North Pole, which is right here. The geomagnetic pole, on the other hand, is, is moving much, much slower. Uh, and because of that, the, why, uh, the, the places where you get your best view, if you, want to, if you want to see the Northern Lights, you can see the Northern Lights on relatively rare occasions here in Vermont or over in New York or in a lot of other places. But if you really want to get them to see them on a regular basis, why? Uh, places like Alaska and, and Canada, southern Greenland and where we were in northern Scandinavia are the ideal places where you can be guaranteed pretty much that you're going to see them. All you really need is, is 
th to have the weatherman get rid of the clouds for you. That's and one of the things I learned, which I was very had never heard of, and it was very surprising to me, that the northern lights also occur on some of our neighboring planets, in particular on the gas giants uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. I, I had never heard that before. I started to do a little research on this. Okay, let's see. Okay, time is good. So we're now leaving Scandinavia, and we're coming to the uh, good old United States. And the US was, was the final of uh, my, my, my bucket list, you might say, what, which I had established 20 years ago, the first time I went to the Arctic. I said, gee, wouldn't it be nice to go and travel in the Arctic region of all seven circumpolar nations? So that's Canada, Greenland, German, um, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Russia. And it took me 20 years to do it, but here a couple of years ago, I actually finally managed to finish it up by going uh, into the um, Arctic region of our own country. And in fact, a very special place within our Arctic, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so now we're, we're, we're up here. And this gives you a feeling, first of all, just to put things in, to give you some scale. Uh, whoop. Uh, as you can see, Alaska is a pretty substantial state, uh, significant size compared to the United States. And we're going to be in the, our, uh, the park, uh, the refuge is right here, which is about the same size as South Carolina. And you can see it here, uh, outlined here, and there are two uh, uh, indigenous settlements there. There's one up on the shore of the Arctic uh, called Koktovik, which is uh, an Inuit settlement. And then there's another one, which you'll see in a better in a second, uh, called Arctic Village, which is on the southern end. And, okay, let me get a little history. Uh, what became the refuge was first set up by, by Eisenhower in 1960. Uh, and it was then in 1980, Congress and Carter expanded it to some 18 million acres and renamed it at that time the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And at the same time, uh, Congress declared that production of oil and gas from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is prohibited until authorized by an act of Congress. So he had to get the right politicians in office in order for that to happen. And uh, in 1988, uh, well, we're not quite there yet. 1988, they actually expanded it again. Uh, okay, and uh, here it is again. Here's this Arctic village, which you can see. And it's an interesting contrast because these are Gwich'in Indians, and they are extremely dependent. Their lifestyle is extremely dependent on the, on the caribou and the migration of the caribou. And so they are very anti any development of the refuge. On the other hand, up here is where the Inuit live, and they like getting a $2,000 check every year from oil development, and so they're very pro-oil uh, uh, development. The place that was singled out in, in some of the legislation was this thing called the 1002 area, which is, is, has no significance other than the 1002 section of the, of the act. And that's the part where they were prohibited from doing any, any drilling uh, until Congress said it was okay to do it. And uh, in 2015, Obama recommended making that a permanent prohibition, uh, but that was rejected. And then along came Mr. Trump, and he said, hey, it would be a good idea. We need more oil and gas. We should open that up. And finally, here um, two years ago, as part of the uh, of the big tax bill, why uh, it was opened up for oil and gas development. And Ryan, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, said, "Well, we're opening up a small non non wilderness area for responsible development." Now, 
I'll let you decide how non-wilderness area is by looking at this map. What you're seeing here, all of these yellow, this is a couple of satellite images, all the yellow spots are where the caribou are going for their, for their birthing. And the 1002 area, you can't quite see it very well on here, but it's basically this area right in here. And that's the spot that's now been opened up for, for um, uh, well, it, it's going to take a while. It, it may be 10 years. Who knows? It may never get developed. It's, 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 it's very difficult uh, uh, to develop uh, oil and gas. By the way, this is Prudhoe Bay up here. You can see the, uh, the structure up there. Uh, one, one of the more fascinating things about uh, the refuge that I didn't know until I got there was that, except for Hawaii, every state in the Union has birds that migrate to, to, the, uh, to the refuge for some part of their, of their, of their year. Okay, now our expedition, there, there, was, there were six of us, and all of us, I didn't realize this until we got there, but all of us, except for one, uh, we're septuagenarians. One, we did have one young 68-year-old on the trip. <laughs> uh, we had two guides and two rafts and three planes to get us, uh, ferry us around. And we were there for 11 days, alternating between rafting and hiking. And finally, uh, took out uh, on the uh, Beaufort Sea, which is part of the Arctic Ocean. And then back to Fairbanks, which is where we, where we started. Uh, here's Alaska, and here, here we are. This is Anchorage. We actually flew into Fairbanks, which is right here. And then from Fairbanks, we went up to the uh, put-in, which is right around here. Oh, yeah, here's another map that are put in. We were going to be rafting down a large river called the Kang Kangakut, and, and you can see it there, uh, another Image. So when we started the trip, we were actually up in the, in the mountains in the so-called Brooks Range. And then as we went down, why we went to lower and lower territory into the tundra and basically got to see five or six different biosphere uh, places in, 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 in the area. Uh, it was a bit of a logistics trick to get us and all our gear up there. And the way we did it was we had two small planes in one large plane. Uh, the two small planes took off from Fairbanks and went up to the put-in up on, on by the river. Some of us got out and some of the gear. Meanwhile, the larger plane went from Fairbanks up to this Inuit village of Kakatovit with a lot more gear and a couple of more of us. And the two small planes, which had brought some of us in, they then took off and went up there took all the gear and the people off of the, the big plane, put it on the small ones, and brought it back. <laughs> Whoops. So here are, here are a couple of us getting us. This is one of our pilots here. And here we are getting on one of the planes. Uh, here we are flying. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Yukon River, which is the biggest river in, in, in Alaska. And it's, as you can see, very serpentine going all over the place. And, uh, you can see one, we, we, there are two, two small planes flying up. Here's our companion plane right there. Okay, these pilots are amazing as to how they can get in. You see we're surrounded by mountains, even more coming into the valley. And then finally coming in for a landing in, in right in the riverbed where we were going to be doing our put-in. Uh, and then a little bit after that, after they dumped some of the people, I, these guys took off again. I'm sorry, did I hear a, did I hear a question? What time of year? Uh, this, was in, uh, this was in June. June, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we were going to be doing rafting, so one of the things we had to haul up there on these planes was, in fact, were the rafts, which were inflatables. And here you see one getting blown up. And here we see a couple of them, that, two of them that are blown up now. And the guys are starting to pack them up and uh, tie all. It's amazing how they got all the gear and us on, on just two rafts. 
uh, but they did. The river we were on is, is, has a lot of splits and forks and it, it goes all over the place and sometimes uh, one raft which I was on was on one side of, uh, of, of, of a land f feature and the, the other uh, raft was over on the other side. Uh, here's a shot showing us on and here's, here, here we'll see what it's like to be on the, uh, on the river I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to mention it. The day we landed, it was 82 degrees. <laughs> uh, and it stayed very warm for the first couple of days. Uh, but then as we went further north, why well, it, it got colder and colder. And by the time we were up by the Arctic Ocean, it wasn't really that cold. It was, it was around... Uh, it was around freezing, around somewhere in the 30s, I think. But but it, it was very very windy. So the, the wind wind chill was, it was it was really quite cold up there. But like I say, when we first we were shocked when we got up there, we had taken all our clothes off. We got all this winter gear. How cold was the water? Yeah. How cold? Well, it's the water is the water is as because it's got ice in it. It's it's right around the freezing point. So the water is 32 degrees or or 31. You, give, you know, plus or minus a little bit there. Uh, yeah, so you didn't want to, you didn't want to go swimming if you could avoid it. Okay. <laughs> okay. How, how about lodging? Well, here's here's we all had a we, two person uh, tents that we stayed in, which were very light and easy to carry, but we also didn't have much room in them. It was it was a bit of a uh, a pain for some of us older folk to get in and out of the thing <laughs> every night and every morning. Uh, here's my friend Jackie who joined me on this trip, and she's sitting there having a, taking a little break. Uh, here's another where some of the, and you can see the wide variety. Here, this is a, a, an early site, and you can see we were completely surrounded by mountains at that point. Uh, this is where we were out more on the tundra, and you can see the mountains are, are off in the distance. Uh, another shot out on the tundra. We did see a fair amount of wildlife, a lot of birds, uh, goats. Uh, caribou, the, the main herd of the caribou had passed through that year, so we didn't, see the, we didn't see the big migration. But there were a few stragglers that came by our camp every once in a while and so and got to see what, uh, what they looked up like fairly close. Now, and I think this is a marmot here, running around the camp at one point. And we also saw, uh, I think, half a dozen grizzly bears, uh, three or four wolves, a bunch, a couple of Arctic foxes. And the grizzlies, uh, th this case, I, like I said, I never saw polar bears, but here I did see grizzly bears. And we were strict, sternly lectured when we got there. Uh, we were all given a, a can of, of bear spray and a belt and told to attach that to our waist and not take it off, okay? Uh, because the bears could be any place and uh, including that you could be walking on what looked like pretty flat ground but had a little dip in it and a bear might have gotten in there to get out of the wind and, and you come walking up on it and surprise them. So you had to be, uh, we were warned to be, just be on guard all the time and, and, uh, and be prepared to pull out your bear spray if needed. Fortunately, we didn't have any confrontations. The bears were all far enough away, far enough, far, far enough away that it didn't bother us, but close enough that we could, that we could see them easily. Um, I just, that's what I just mentioned. Uh, it was springtime, so there were quite a few flowers around, uh, Arctic flowers, very you know, short, almost just a, couple inches above the ground kind of foliage and flowers. And uh, when we were not, we rafted on alternate days and we weren't, when we weren't rafting, why we took hikes in some of the local area. And this just shows you what some of the terrain was like that we hiked through and, and some of the magnificent 
scenery that we were able to uh, enjoy when we were up on some of the uh, small mountains that we were able to uh, to uh, climb uh, during that period. It's really just absolutely uh, one of the most beautiful places on the world, and there's just nobody there except for a few people like us. And, and it's very, as far as, as organized trips, it's very highly regulated. Individuals can go up there without any special permits, but but there aren't too many people around. We, we did see one other group at one point. But there's no evidence of human. There's no garbage around. There's no, no detritus. It's just, it really is, is pristine wilderness, uh, uh, unlike anything you can see any place else in the world. Uh, we did a little fishing along the way. This is me having caught my first Arctic char. And uh, my friend Jackie caught one a little bit later. And, and then a few days later, this one time we were up on the, right on the shore of the, uh, right by the Arctic Ocean. And that time I caught my, uh, that's when I caught my lunk, what my guide said was a local lunker that was about a seven pound fish. Uh, and uh, we did, uh, what did we do with the fish? We ate them. <laughs> no waste. And speaking of eating, fine dining, this is, uh, this is actually a, a lunch spot. You can see we're set up. And all the, f all the food had to be packed into three uh, bare, impregnable uh, <laughs> containers. And uh, it, was, it was amazing to me that these guys could put all the food and in these cans for a total of, uh, yeah, eight of us for 11 days. Wow. And in those, <laughs> it was amazing the way they packed it and the efficiency. And it wasn't, it wasn't like we were having, you know, powder meals all the time or because I think I got to pay. Well, that was when we were there for the night, we'd set up another tent, which we could use for eating if it got too windy so we could all gather inside there. But oh yeah, now here's an example of a breakfast, okay? Eggs Benedict with, uh, with fresh artichoke. I mean with fresh, not artichoke, fresh uh, avocado, okay? Uh, they were wonderful at the way they could prepare meals out in the middle of nowhere and, 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 and given all the restrictions they had to deal with in terms of putting every, packing everything up and putting it in these cans every day. Uh, and here are a couple of us uh, enjoying lunch here. Uh, the, the breakfast, let me go back to that in a second. Uh, the, we had very well prepared and hearty breakfasts and, and, and dinners. Lunches was like all the, whenever I've been in, out, out in the, on the trail in the Arctic, it's, it's cheese and sausage and candy and stuff you fill your pockets with and you sort of nibble on it uh, all day long. Well, in this case, we did stop and actually it would set out some, some um, a little bit more peanut butter and, and salmon and yeah, it was all, all good food, very, very healthy food too. Okay, these are the, um, these are five of the people that were on there. I'm taking the picture, so I'm not in that one. And here we are, the six of us. And I, I'll come back to the people uh, in, in a little bit later, but let me just mention that, because it's the best shot I have of it, I think, is you see the, the layers in this ice? That's a rather unique uh, form of ice called, it's a German name, it's called, uh, yeah, what, no, Auf Ice, that's what it's called, Auf Ice, A-U-F-E-I-S. And what happens there is that the river or somebody starts to freeze over and then it forms a dam and there's still fresh f running water above, so the water flows over the ice, and then it freezes and forms a bigger dam, and then more, more water. And so you, you get these successive layers of ice building up uh, over the course of the winter. This is one of our guides. This is, uh, his name is Cameron, and he was a, uh, he, did, he only guided for about two months a year. The rest of his time, he worked down in Fairbanks as a nurse. And this is Andrew, and he guides all year. And Andrew 
is the success story of many of you may have read Into the Wild about the chap who decided he was going to go up and live in Alaska and, and had a very unfortunate and untimely ending. Uh, Andrew is a Texan, and when he was in high school, he saw some kind of a, a film on Alaska, and he says, that's where I'm going. So he graduated from high school, got himself a one-way ticket uh, to Alaska, went up there, and he's been up there ever since. He's met, a, uh, met his wife up there, and uh, since has had a couple of kids, and the family lives out in the uh, uh, outside the uh, any outside the town, and, and basically he lives a, a semi subsistence uh, kind of uh, of life. Uh, they uh, they get most of their protein from fishing and hunting, and uh, and uh, pretty much they have some solar installation to take care of their electricity, and they basically live out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, with two kids, and they're obviously thriving early. <laughs> Significance of this picture, which by the way, we're really on the tundra now, and you can see the mountains are, are way back. So why are we all sitting there like that with things over our faces? Wind. It was like a hurricane that day. And we, we got behind this bank trying to get out of the wind and, and, and bundled up and covered up our... our oh yeah, <laughs> I didn't notice that. That's gotta be one of our guides. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, the last few days we were there, it, it really did get very, very windy. And, and uh, it wasn't, it still wasn't that cold, but the wind, it was, uh, it got to be, it got to feel very cold. Uh, it's not a shot of the, and at one point in time, the wind got so bad that we could not, we could not paddle uh, the rafts faster than the current was taking us back, or the wind combined with, it wasn't the current, the current was taking us in the right direction, the wind. And so we had, a, we all got off onto some of the ice here. This is one of us uh, getting off. And then our, our two guides, we were put all up, up on the ice and the two guides uh, got out and, and one of them was in the raft and the other one was like a mule and they basically manhauled the raft up to the, the final piece of, uh, close to our final destination there while the rest of us walked on, the, walked on the ice. And here's where we got to, this is where we were going to end up. We still had about 100 yards of very windy water to get over but we just went all at it and we managed to get across and ended up on this very skinny, uh, couple hundred yard wide by 20 mile long island that's right on the shore of the Arctic Ocean and that was where we set up our final camp uh, and spent a couple days then, time to go home, so here we are taking the air out of the, uh, out of the uh, rafts and again, these amazing pilots who could, before, we, before they could come in, we, had, we were under orders to prepare a runway, so we had to spend uh, a good part of one day walking around and trying to clear out a lot of this uh, rubble that was there so that they could come in for a safe landing. And uh, as you can see, there's still a lot of junk around, but they still managed to find a way to get down. Yeah, that's, it, they're just amazing the way they, they, these pilots. Okay, now we're heading home and there's just a couple of uh, shots out the window of the Brooks Range as we're flying through it and, and just some, some beautiful mountain scenery. Uh, this is the, this is, I mentioned earlier, the Arctic Village. This is a, the, the tribe is a Gwich'in uh, and they live on the southern extreme of the, uh, of the refuge and they're the ones that are, their whole culture and, and economy, you might say, is very dependent on the migration of the caribou. So they're very unhappy about um, opening up the refuge to, uh, to drilling. And here we are all back in our hotel in Fairbanks and everybody is uh, none the worse for wear. And the, the, another interesting fact that I learned about, about this crew, which 
was that uh, three of the six of us were sur cancer survivors. Uh, one, this fellow Ed, who lives in Maine, it was had quite severe uh, case. And the other two, there was one, I think one woman had breast cancer and one had, I don't know, ovarian cancer or something like that. But other than that, the, the, uh, the, the only thing that really had us all in common, other than our, our young age, was the fact that all of us have been lifelong outdoors people and wanting to get out. And just because you get to be 70 doesn't mean it's time to stop. So we had a very good time together. And I think I now say thank you. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> Oh. Waste. Oh. You mean, okay. Uh, as far as as far as human waste, uh, I mean, from from you people, uh, that we we buried. Uh, we we burned any TP it used, and then we buried any solid waste. Uh, all of the other kitchen detritus and cooking and so on that we just put back in the cans and took it home I mean that we didn't we didn't leave uh, we didn't leave anything other than our crap and our pee behind and no paper and no no nothing else were, um, were insects a problem in Alaska. Thank you for, 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 for you know, I'm, I'm getting to be like a politician. A politician, every time they get a question, thank you for that wonderful <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, that's something I was very nervous about as we were thinking about this trip because Alaska has, is known for having ferocious mosquitoes, okay? Uh, and I was very concerned about that. And I talked with the, the guy who was organizing it. I said, hey, what about this? He says, he says, not to worry, we're going to put you in, in a location where the insect, insects will be about two days south of where you are. He said, and then we're going to move, and then they'll come up to where you were, and then we'll move again. And he said, we're just going to stay one or two days ahead of the spring outburst of, of mosquitoes. And he was right on because we, we never saw a single mosquito. I think I may have seen a, a fly once or twice, but that was about it. So there was, there was, that was no problem at all. But if we'd been there a week later, it would have been horrible. And, you know, and you've probably read stories or heard of the, the caribou. It just drives them crazy because they, they get them in, inside their nasal passages and their throats. And it's just really miserable. Uh, I actually had a couple of cameras. One, they were both point and shoot, uh, and one was a small Canon, and the other one was a. Um, I'm I'm forgetting the name of the brand, and the reason for that is while I was up there, it 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 broke on me, and so I can't remember the brand that <laughs> broke, but. Um, yeah, there were n not anything, uh, and a lot of these, a lot of the pictures, other pictures that I took today were were just cell phone pictures. Yeah. You talked about the Russians or the Soviets having a facility on Svalbard, and I wondered how the Norwegians permitted that. Well, they didn't. Okay, or they, I mean, they 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 got they went up and oh, you mean during the Cold War? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, that is a good question, and I don't really know the answer for that, uh, other than the fact that, uh, you know, the, the Russians have a pretty significant presence up, up there. And, it looks like uh, they have about half of the circumference of the, of the circle. Oh, oh, as far as the Arctic overall is concerned. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, well, between Canada and Russia, I mean, they've got, they've got the lion's share of, of not only the land, but also... Well, Russia, not only the land, but also the lion's share of the people that live in the Arctic. I mean, most of the people that live, this is going back to lecture one, most of the people that live in the Arctic are in, either in Russia or in the Scandinavian countries. There are almost none that live in Greenland. I mean, there are people there, but it's, you're talking hundreds. And 
there are relatively few that live in Canada and relatively few live in the in, in, uh, U.S. Arctic. But I don't, I, I'm going to have to find out about that. I, I, I don't think it was done. I'm sure there was some diplomatic horse trading had to be done to, uh, to, 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 to get that. Uh, I mean, during World War II, it was, it was I, mean, I mean, there they were fighting, okay, but uh, how they got there. How the Soviets got a, a facility in a NATO country. Well, see, it's not really, I mean, Norway is a NATO country, but this is not a NATO territory, Except I don't think. Norway owns it. Well, Norway has sovereignty, <laughs> with caveats, okay. Well, none of the caveats had anything to do with the Soviets having a base there. No, you're right. No, the, the, ca the, ca the caveat no said, the caveat said, the, the, the operative caveat was no militarization of Svalbard, okay. Uh, but. but they would is this the spot that they did the nuclear testing? Or oh no no no! Monitoring no. something else. No, they were they were, they were basically um, they were basically there more for for weather weather gathering, gathering mm -hmm. uh, because the, the the big ports of Murmansk and uh, Angles something or other Arkhangelsk Arkhangelsk uh, are their their big open water ports and so they're. They, they, they want good weather, and this is the best place to get weather for, or one of the best places to get weather, at least presumably before satellites. I'm not sure it's all that important now anymore. How difficult was it to arrange these trips? Uh, well, it depended, it depended on the trip. Uh, Could you repeat that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he asked me how difficult it was to arrange the trips. And the difficulty varied uh, from, for example, the Sweden-Finland one. In, when we were in Finland, we were with a package tour, and that was just a matter of going to the internet, finding an outfit, and signing up, and giving their money. Uh, in Sweden, we basically rolled our own. I mean, we, we found hotels, and we found uh, car rental, and made all the arrangements. Uh, probably the most difficult trip uh, to arrange and, and, and to get to is, is the one that's next, which was the, our, our trip to the North Pole. I mean, that took a lot of preparation, and not only gear-wise, but physical training and mental and, and all kinds of stuff. So that one was, was quite difficult to arrange to get to. So you're not going to ski it? We did ski. To the North Pole? Yes. Ski. Uh, we had dog sleds also, but the dogs, the sleds were there to haul the, the uh, food and um, the water equivalent. Uh, water equivalent is basically gasoline because, of course, there's no, there is no water up there. You have to melt ice to get water. And so about half of your freight is gasoline to melt water, and the other half is, is actual food. Pardon me? Which North Pole? Which, oh, this was the geomagnetic. I'm sorry. This was the geographic North Pole, yes. <laughs> the real one, the one in which we're all spinning around. <laughs> and you're going to tell us about that in the summer. Yes. Uh, when is your next? Uh, it's scheduled, when is it? It's August 13th, I think. Yeah, I think it's August 13th, yes. Uh, was anything said about storage of grain and seeds that is uh, on Svalbard. Yes. No, I didn't, I, we didn't. People go to see that. Yeah, well, we, we, we didn't do that. Uh, but I, yes, that is, that is one, of the, one of the things that Svalbard is, is, is sort of famous for these days. But they have this large seed bank mm -hmm. uh, up there, which, uh, but we didn't, we didn't go there. We didn't, we didn't have any, any uh, experience with that. You indicated, I think, three different North Poles. The, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the geomagnetic is, a, is different from the magnetic North Pole. What's the difference, difference between those two? Okay, well, the geographic one, you know, that's, that's where the globe rotates. And the magnetic pole is the one that's determined by where, which direction does your compass when you're using a compass here on the surface of Earth. Yeah. So the mag, you're looking, it's the magnetic lines which are 
mostly parallel to the surface of the Earth. That's why the compass can work. And that's also why the compass doesn't work very well when you get close to the pole, because there the magnetic lines of force are, are, ver are, are tend to be vertical. So you use a compass and it wants to point up. So you can't, you can't really use a compass very well up there. But anyway, the magnetic pole, as it's called, is, is simply the pole at which the compass points to on the surface of the Earth. The geomagnetic pole is, or the geomag, yeah, is is determined by the by the far field, the, the far field in, in in space, magnetic field of, of of Earth. So that that one you have to have satellites up there, and you have to map out where the magnetic lines of force are, and and then you find out hey, where are they coming from? They're coming from a slightly different location from where they seem to be coming from when you're on the surface. guides and others who've been there for over the years, did you have much discussion of climate change and what they've seen? Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, never far from the kind of conversation, a topic of conversation. Yeah, so we talked about that a lot. And, and uh, I've had uh, varied experiences relative to our warming in the, in the Arctic. Uh, you saw the pictures in Svalbard when we were up there, and it was extremely, but whether that was climate change or whether that was just a, a warm uh, early spring. Uh, one of my earlier trips, in fact, the one to Wrangell Island, was sort of the anti-climate change experience because when we got there, we had to go to a small uh, a city, actually, in uh, the far east of, of, of Russia called Pyevek. And from there, we had to take a helicopter over to this island that we were going to have our, our expedition on. And to, and to get to the island, we had to go in a helicopter. And to get to the, heli and the helicopter, had to get fuel. But we couldn't get fuel. They couldn't get fuel. And the reason was that the way they got fuel to that particular location was they came up from uh, Vladivostok up through the Bering Strait and around. And even though it was July that year, the ice hadn't gone out. So they hadn't gotten a supply ship in that year. Was, so it was much colder that year than it normally was. So you know, again, it's this mix up between weather and climate. I mean, there's no question. Probably the most, the clearest example that I've experienced either directly or indirectly in talking to people who go up there is that the, the, the polar Eskimos, are, their lifestyle is definitely changing because they have a much shorter season. The ice forms much later in the year and goes out much earlier in, 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 in the spring. So their lifestyle is, is, is being dramatically impacted. Um, I just had another thought there that I wanted to mention. What was it? Um, uh, yeah, it, it escaped me. But yeah, so there are there are there are um, there are some like there in the. Oh yeah, I, I know what I wanted to mention. I've talked to some of my Arctic traveling friends um, and acquaintances who've been up to the North Pole recently. Okay, uh, within the last year or two, and. One thing is you can no longer do, we, you don't know what we did, but you come back in August, you'll find out what we did, but you can't do that anymore, okay? Because the, the ice is too broken up, there's too much open water. And also, it, it's, it, the weather is horrible. When we were there, it was nice and bright and sunny. Now it's like a constant fog because there's so much open water. And, and so there you can see, and, and and we'll talk about that even more because uh, in the final talk, I'm going to show some of the data on what's happening to the ice in the Arctic Ocean, which is not only shrinking but it's getting thinner and it's and it's uh, so there are, there's there's no question when you're up there because up in in the in the Arctic, the rate of climate uh, of temperature increase is uh, roughly twice what it is any place else in the world. Nobody really, there are theories as to why that is, but I haven't been able to find a, a solid case as to why that is. But, so it's happening much faster up there. 
And uh, like I say, if, certainly if you go uh, northern Greenland or all the way to the pole, you're going to see pretty solid evidence that there's significant changes going on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.